recording somewhere. Okay, yeah. Okay. So what do you say? We begin and you can also do the Facebook or whatever you need to do. And yeah. It's, okay, so uh, shall we start now or? Yeah, we can. I think we should start I, now. I think we can start because we have a few participants watching on the Facebook page. So yeah, perfect. So let's just start. And then because it is recorded, they. Okay, they, so. um. Yeah, so welcome um, everyone to CCN Lecture 3. Yes, yeah, so um, as you know, uh, we'll uh, present us uh, mm -hmm. regarding uh, the topic. Um, uh, hang on. Yeah, sorry. So the topic me. for today is the introduction to plan planet plates in some round or dom in J Pro. Wins. Yeah, so for now, I would give the floor to uh, thank Monizé. you. Hi, yeah, everybody. So thank you thank so you. much for joining. I had a little difficulty with the uh, with my mouse. So, yeah, so yeah, so today I'm speaking from Green Shoots Foundation. We are a UK registered charity, but we have been working in Cambodia for the last uh, 11 years. And we we have a great project in the north uh, in Udarmen Jay province. And I plan to introduce you not only the project, uh, what we do there, but also different work that we are doing from, from over there. So Plan Planet Plate is a small research project that we are starting in our, in our bigger program. And this is a three-part lecture. So this is the first part where I introduce you where it is, why we are doing it, who is all involved. And then the second two lectures are gonna be with our uh, principal investigator and they will talk more about the research methods. There's also a little bit of coding and technical uh, in, um, sort of digital skills involved. So they will also talk about that. And so hope you enjoy. So this is the agenda. And so I think what I can do is to turn my video off and this easier. So first I will introduce you to me, who am I and the Green Shoots Foundation, what our impact has been so far. So as I said, we've been in Cambodia for the last 11 years. So we've clearly, you know, done a lot of different activities. So what are they? Let's definitely share them with you. Then the main topic is to introduce you to this project, Plant Planet Plate. I also want to do a small group activity but since we are a smaller group online, so we can just do it as it is by talking to each other. And then what are our research goals and our field work plan? So, so Green Shoots is our mission is to help improve, like encourage sustainable development and we, in the world, and especially here in Cambodia. And we always want to do holistic program, programs so that means we want to work on programs that are multi-purpose. They have more than one impact area. We always combine economic development with sort of food and agriculture, which is the case for our work in Cambodia. But in other countries, we work on healthcare and economic development. We always work with local partners. So our team in Odarminche is is from that province. They are people that grew up. Actually, one of the one of the person working is our neighbor. And the other person working is um, from the local council. He's part of the local council as well. So we work with local partners and our main aim is to build their capacity so they can carry on with the project. celebrated quite a few years. And, um, and I can say with great proudness that I've been part of the organization since then. So I was first an intern for them and then I started managing the project in Cambodia, and now I'm the operations manager there. My background is in environmental science and um, looking especially at social science around environment, so how people care about the environment, what, how they sort of uh, um, understand what it means to look after the environment. And I look specifically at small-scale farming, so which is familiar to a lot of you studying at the University of Agriculture. So I look at the resources available to smallholder farmers, what techniques they can apply, how they can be nature friendly and still have a high yield. 
So that is something that we try to do at our center. We want to look at the rural economy, but also look at sustainable agriculture skills and business development. So that is our vision for the food and agriculture initiatives phase. And as I had mentioned, they are always multi-purpose. So we always look at the overlapping areas. We always want to see where we can fit, where it's educational, it's teaching skills, but it's also looking at sort of economic development, ways that people can earn income, ways that people can, can have a livelihood option as well. So a country, of course, you're all familiar with. This is where we are based in Cambodia, right there close to the Thai border. So it's in Udar Minchir province in Samrong town. And the it is strategically there because we knew that from other organizations working, other NGOs working in this province, that they have a high rate of high school dropouts. So people are not necessarily finishing education full time. They can go across the Thai border very easily to work and come back. And so there is a lot of mobility in rural areas. And that is actually quite normal. That is happening all over the world. People want to go. But as we all know that rural areas are the places that provide food for a lot of um, the country. 80% of Cambodia is living in rural areas and you need to have some skills retained there. You need to have some skills and opportunities still making those places attractive. We cannot have just a gap, right? So that was the reason it instigated us to work in schools there to begin with. And then we slowly build our program. So we are there as a community center for people to access. Its concept is very similar to the mini agricultural technology parks that CSAN has. And, um, and so you will see in this presentation. So here's a little bit of a graphic to show all the different um, kind of context of our work. So rural migration, livelihood opportunities, people do have to go, they have to earn an income. There is, but because of, kind of unsustainable ways of people moving and farm practices. Rural areas don't have the sort of um, kind of resilience that they should. So through our funding and our skills and our involvement with young people, we want to regenerate that area. We want to bring more um, ways of working, more, more skills for, for farming techniques, and, and that's really how we've begun to work there. So some of our impact, so as I mentioned, we started almost 10 years ago. So between 2013 and 2018, we established 45 school vegetable gardens. We worked directly with schools, high schools, secondary schools, and also some primary schools. They were all part of the World Food Program, which meant that any food and vegetables and produce that they were growing, they could cook and eat outside. So that nutrition angle was unexpected for us, but it was also an, a plus. It meant this, pro this project was called the Agriculture Skills in Public Schools. And it meant that we sort of had kind of a wider reach. We were in different schools. We, 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 our team would go there and train people and work with the school manager. So each school had a school garden manager that was a teacher we had trained. So it had a quite a wide reach. But the thing was, it was all very same. Everybody was doing the vegetable garden. Everybody was growing the same vegetable in the same way. So it was all very same. And for us, we were coming to a point to scale up. What could we do? So actually, we decided to establish a training space of our own where we could do a lot of experiments. We could be more demonstrative. And we could look at more than just vegetable gardening. So normally when people think about scaling up, they think about going bigger, just 45, let's do 85 schools. But for us, we thought, okay, we will actually make one place, but do lots of different things and maintain good links within Udar Menche, because that is the province we are committed to. And it's the province that we understand the local context the most, and we have the best links with the government and also with local council and village leaders. So we are in one small village and we maintain links with the same schools. They come and they visit this space. It's a beautiful building. I invite all of you to come. Um, RP who is on the call recently was there for about a month. Um, it is, and we actually won an award for the architecture 
So we use a lot of earth blocks, a lot of bamboo, a lot of natural materials, which are common in Cambodia anyway. So we used all of those styles of building and in the following on in the presentation, I will share some more photos. So this is what it looks like now. Um, this is a picture from last year and it's uh, definitely thriving in terms of its, its natural beauty. It has lots of fruit trees, lots of um, kind of vegetables growing and it's very green. <laughs> Even though during COVID, we didn't have a lot of students coming because we were not allowed to run with the school curriculum, but we maintained all our biodiversity commitments. So, but now we still continue to work with schools. So 30 students come every week from the same local schools that we worked with. They participate in the similar activities, but they're more theoretical learning in the classroom. And they can also participate in things like fish and frog raising. They understand the, the fish breeding, frog breeding, and how we can sort of manage that on a smaller scale in, in these kind of ponds and not the natural pond. And, um, and it's also a great way for our center to earn a little bit of income. So as I had mentioned, it's really nice and green now. So this is what it would look like in 2018 when we had first started and this is what it's looking like well two years ago now but um, we have to take another updated drone photo but our commitment is as I mentioned to young people and their skills but also to the natural environment we look at improving biodiversity we have more than 30 fruit trees on site when we were doing the construction, we left all the trees as it is, and we are really sort of, you know, committed to looking after them. And even if they are not fruit trees, they are still important. And, and COVID was a really sort of important time for us because it, it made us rethink our role in the community. We are there, we are right in the middle of five villages. How can we support this sort of uh, this whole space around us? and in terms of the people that live there, but also the environment. We are surrounded by rice fields, as you can see, and very, very slowly, every, every year I go back, there is a house next door or there is some more construction. So the city is definitely growing. And you know, maybe in 10, 15 years, it will be sort of an urban farm, who knows? But for now, we work on different types of sort of projects we like to do in, work in the community we do a lot of farm to table so that is like the edible landscape that I think CSAN is focusing on in May so we this is actually a team lunch that we did where we picked all the vegetables and we did like a restaurant experience which was really fun because we took regular things and sometimes like things that people don't eat so much uh, and we cook them in different ways so it was very exciting we also have a kitchen which is now a biogas kitchen so we have a biodigester and we get clean cooking gas and yeah so so which brings me to our new project which is called plant planet plate and you know um, i'm still saying it in the right order even after one year so Project description, so our aim is to document wild food knowledge and foraging techniques in Cambodia. And we want to demonstrate that we want to build a resilient landscape. The resilient landscape means a landscape that you can rely on to give you food, that is um, a landscape that can support the people that live on it, but the people living on it are also supporting it to keep it going. And we want to understand the food history. So Cambodia has a rich food history. It has very ancient cuisine and the cuisine is linked to what is growing there you know it's we cannot look at the two things separately we can we have to look at it together the things people eat and the things people grow and and the main goal is food security so how are people being fed Cambodia has a dark history also when it comes to food security because it has gone through a very rough time of civil uh, sort of uh, unrest and during that time, food security was seen in a very different way because of how people were fed and what they were eating. So, so all of that now brings us to a richness of what Khmer cuisine is. 
and there is med medicinal food in the cuisine. There is regional importance. People in different parts of Cambodia eat different things. Odarmenche is close to the Thai border, and it's there's pretty. I'm pretty sure it is more spicy than other parts because of close to Thailand. And so yeah, so we want to now start looking a little bit at how people eat to understand what we grow. And so our activities are three main activities. So firstly, we want to create a digital library of Khmer foods and how we can adapt them to climate change. We want to work with the local farmers who are the knowledge holders of this. They have knowledge that is passed down by generation or they have knowledge that is shared between them. And so we want, and also some of them can be maybe understanding more about the medicinal foods. So we want to get uh, sort of do the data collection with them and put it online. And, and then we want to showcase the growing techniques at the Agritech Center. So all the plants that we put on the database, we will also have a living library in the Agritech Center. And this is great. The data collection and how we will do that. So because we are 12, I was going to do a group activity, but actually we can just do it if you unmute yourself or want to write in chat. But what is your understanding of wild food? You know, I understand that most of the people in the call are Khmer, and so I want to know from you. But RP, you're in India, so we can also get a little bit from you as well. So maybe five words you associate with wild food, you can unmute yourself and just say it, or you can type in the chat if you're feeling a bit shy. But yeah, what are the five words you associate? And then name two wild food, and it can, it can be Cambodian or it can be from other, other parts of the world, and how you ate them. Anybody? Well, I'll give it a start just to get the ball rolling. Thanks. Uh, India is, uh, is quite at a crossroads. This is a mid middle of multiple different cuisine cultures. But one of, I, I can't say, I can say name five words to start with. But one crucial aspect of Indian food definitely used to be uh, a word we call here called a sattvic. Okay. which uh, based on Ayurvedic principles is supposed to first and foremost form a component of multiple health needs. So it is supposed to, uh, and, and with the help of food, you can own yourself in different directions to have more focus or more uh, energy or more whatever you want. You know? So that's why mm -hmm. food complementary and the dish, the plating is made such way. Uh, this has quite shifted a lot with the modern cuisine of Indian cuisine that you see outside of the country and you will some parts of the country, but if you go still now to a traditional meal, which they call a thali, you will see bits and pieces of every item, uh, so that each of them are supposed to give you a different uh, health benefit. Mm. And uh, wild foods, which being such a shame, because I uh, it used to be a common part of daily home cuisine. Yeah. Uh, and but in fact, yesterday I was discussing how, and I've spoken with you about some of these have been completely disappeared from our markets in the last, especially in the last 15, 20 years. Uh, the abundance of green leaves mm. uh, of different kind, and it's also seasonal. And where I stay now, definitely seasonals because we use green leaves are more in the winter. Uh, you have uh, uh, more of the protein rich in the summer, like paneer and all, and. So they rotate as for what the availability is. Garlic content goes high in the winter because they farm it around that time. So also cucumber and all. But uh, come summer, uh, then the, the crops change. And there's a lot of wheat and uh, rice growing. So it's more bulky, more uh, calorie dense. But in the winter, mm. it is actually more fiber dense. Yeah. And so, I think you touch on a really important uh, point, which is the seasonality, you know, like, before and I grew up in Pakistan and even I remember it's you know certain green leaf 
you associate it then with certain time of the year as well. And, and I'm, you know, it's the same in, in Cambodia. Um, and, and yes, the other thing that you mentioned, which is also important, is this idea of like eating certain things for certain benefits, health benefits or bodily benefits. So that knowledge, the Ayurvedic medicine, which is the uh, Indian sort of traditional medicine, is there is also Khmer traditional medicine, which I don't know much about, but I'm learning and it's very exciting for me. And I'm seeing some similarities, you know, things like turmeric is good for certain things, certain teas are good for certain things there's heat hot foods and cool foods so anybody else do you want to share a bit about um wild food so this can be like things in the in the forest um somebody no. um i can share yeah. yeah from my experience actually uh, Actually, um, for most of Cambodian, we experience eating wild food until right now. But we, many of us, not all, but not but not many of us aware that we are eating the wild foods. Yeah. You know? Like, for example, that what I used to eat so far is the Acacia Panata. Yeah. I don't know whether I spell it the right the, correctly or not. And another one, I will type in the text later. Uh, okay. Uh, Avela Bilimbi. <laughs> I don't know what that is. I will type in the text. Okay. So. Okay. Yeah. So um, I like it a lot. Yeah. But I I did not realize that it the wild foods. <laughs> yeah. So another message in the chat is that wild food are ones that grow on the farmland, wild plants, they are diversified, available, accessible, and nutritionally rich. That is also true. I'm not an expert on wild food, certainly. I want to put that out there. I am learning as I go along. And uh, thank you for writing the names. I will definitely look them up. And oh, you can also see the chat because I'm sharing my screen. Um, but yeah, so so that I think the main thing that was said in the chat is that it is just growing naturally. It is just there, and and the knowledge of knowing that it can be eaten or not eaten is is the key. You know, I when I'm in Odraminche and I'm with sort of young kids from school, they know what berry to eat. The red berry crop grow home the small red berry in the tree like wild cherry they just know it and and I just follow them but because I can trust them so it's that little link about how you pass it on or how you learn about it and there is a chance that it can also be lost because people will just eat more and more from supermarket or from markets so I move on and this is some of my favorite Kumar wild food so it is this leaf I, I just call it the sour leaf I don't know the name if somebody knows the name in Kumar please tell me um, and then here it's sort of you know when you get when you order the bachao or you get your food you get a whole basket of all these greens that you can eat they're edible but they don't have a necessarily a farm for it and finally it is the mushroom which is very seasonal rainy season means you go in the forest and you look for the mushrooms and then you fry it or cook it and make it in different styles so i'm sure many of you here are available uh, avail are familiar with these wild foods that are available and like um, it was shared we don't necessarily think that they are wild because we are we are just enjoying them but there is actually no farm for them they are not sold in the shop as such and so that kind of information where I was seeing it in Cambodia as I was working on a regular basis. And then in uh, 2019, from 2020, we did a survey in the local community that we work with. And we asked them a lot of questions about food security during COVID and how they cope and did they grow their own vegetables. And a lot of family members said that wild food and and knowing you can just such 
he's also teaching in, in the Netherlands, so he might not have been able to join the call. But he has a PhD in Eco Gastronomy, Education and Society. So she's the principal investigator for this project. And the next few lectures, it will be her speaking more about her experience and her um, and her PhD, uh, their PhD, sorry. And so Ashley um, has worked on Khmer traditional medicine, done lots of in-depth study about how people understand it in Cambodia, how they um, know the ingredients and uh, and this is going to traditional healers normally and asking them about what they prescribe and their research um, highlights the wealth of ingredients available so again it is already linking a lot with things that i was finding about food security and wild foods and and items that they were researching and so we are now doing this collaboration of plant planet plate where Green Shoots looks at it from a food growing perspective and actually their research looks at it from a consumption and perspective and how people eat it and access it and learn more about it. So it is a great sort of collaborative work where the Agritech Center is, is the base and we go out and do some research. And so our research goals are biodiversity, safeguarding. So it's important to look after these wild foods because they're wild they're just growing nobody planted them but somebody has to look after them in in a world of sort of climate change and changing environment and the other goal is to build uh, educational resources and then finally intangible cultural heritage so in the word in itself is difficult because intangible means it's not something that that is a real physical outcome. It's more of a feeling. So it's about feeling Khmer, of feeling proud of, of, of what you are preserving and understanding about the culture. But in terms of the tangible uh, outcomes, we will write, we will collect data and write and code eight digital essays. And um, we will have less than sort of, there will be less than 3000 words. So, so that is still pretty long for me because I haven't written an essay in so long, but, but they will be thoroughly researched and good. And they will be translated into English, French and Khmer because we want it to have a global, uh, a global reach. And then the other goal is to have that vegetable garden at the Agritech, the uh, wild food garden at the Agritech center, which reflects. So it's, it's, it's a bit real time. We're seeing what, how the environment impacts wild food. So we are creating a, a, an eco, smaller mini ecosystem to develop wild foods and understand how you can grow them. And I know there are certain projects in Batambong where they are, they are actively um, making wild food gardens and trying to do a little bit of a commercial work around it because you can earn an income. There are medicinal, they actually have a higher value globally because the West has more um, interest in these ingredients as well. And, but uh, so, yeah, so this is, and the fieldwork objectives is in the summer, we will do 50 semi-structured interviews with farmers, medicinal healers, uh, traditional healers and um, consumers. And then we will generate a list of the commonly foraged plants and understand how they are used. <clears throat> and then we will also create a sort of recipe re repertoire. So that means how people are using certain plants. And again, the, the, the people that pass on this knowledge to us will be credited and um, of course recognized. And, this will, and they, we will also collect the uh, plant vouchers specimens. So this is something new for me. Um, because I have not done any botanical research. So I'm very excited to learn how we can do that. And so these are our dates. So December to May, we are doing lots of our kind of logistics and talking to students and making them understand our research. Then June and July, the key dates where we will be on the ground and we will be doing our data collection. Then we will be writing sort of our essays and doing some peer reviews. So that means other researchers look at our work and they say that it is okay. So that gives you more credibility. 
then we will be doing lots of coding to, um, or other people will be doing lots of coding, maybe not me, <laughs> to understand how to put it up online. And, and then finally, our goal is to keep going and keep growing this database. So some outcomes, I know I have already mentioned them, but I'll just repeat them. So immediate is we will have 50 interview responses immediately after the fieldwork. That means we will have a wealth of data and information. We will identify eight plants. We will do lots of food events. So the similar to the plant, the food um, uh, farm to plate that I mentioned, but this will be catered more around wild foods. Then we will do the plant vouchers to share at local herbarium. So if CSAN has an, or RUA has an herbarium, we will contribute there. And then the setup of the wild foods living library at the agritech center. The long-term outcomes, which can be a bit more of the intangible ones is besides having the database, we will definitely have opportunities to develop further research. We already have interest from universities in Netherlands to do similar work. So there's options opportunities to collaborate between the two countries. And then we can long-term is to observe the impacts of climate change and the changing of the environment on the wild plants and how we can troubleshoot. And then we continue to keep building the database. So the key purpose to do this lecture with all of you online is that you can join us, the students from the university are, you know, they can be part of this study. There is a link here, which um, I want to actually put in the chat. So you can then fill out this Google form. It's quite simple. It's going to ask you a few questions, your availability. And, um, and yeah, we can sort of discuss how people can be part of the research group. What am I doing? And, and yeah, so the next sessions we will have is one on research methods. There will be one on coding, how we code for this database. And um, we will try, to, we will most likely plan for an in-person lecture on 13 June, because we will be there in, in the country. So before we go further, because I want to open it for questions, but what I'll do is I will share my screen to show you how the database is looking. We have a, a open source right now. It's uh, available to see. Um, go back to the Zoom. And then... And I see that Ashley is on the call. So if you want to add Ashley something, please go ahead. But hopefully you can see my screen and this is what we expect a database uh, entry to look like where you, it's a bit like a Wikipedia page kind of, but with more detail and, and photographs. So it's, this is for the ingredient uh, coconut, um, and we, we purposely chose this because it is familiar enough for people from all audiences to look at and understand the functionality because the purpose of creating this link as a prototype is our donors and other organizations can understand what the, what the purpose is. So they, it, we wanted to keep it quite a, a neutral, neutral ingredient. Um, and so it has some botanical details and also the historical overview with some nice photographs. And um, Ashley is the true expert on, on this. So if you did want to chip in, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi, everybody. Um, I'm sorry about coming in late. I had a class to teach this morning. But what's really nice about the program that we're using, which is called Juncture by JSTOR, is that it's all open access and open linked, which means that it's free to use, free to learn, and all of the facts can be linked to unique Wikipedia data points, which then give you more resources. Um, one of the nice features, I think, the most about JSTOR Juncture is that the essays use like archival material that exists that we could produce 
from like we collect the plant samples and scan them and really showcase the national herbariums collections or we use other ones from around the world to support our project and we want to do things with art so like for example if there is a Khmer artist that enjoys drawing like different plants that we're researching or a photographer who's really interested in nature photography, we're willing to uh, commission and pay them for their art and keep it within the archive. Um, and what's also nice is that if you're looking for a career in academia is that the structure of these essays will count as a academic publication because it will be peer reviewed. So um, I highly recommend it if you are very interested in plants and plant humanities and just, you know, working on cultural heritage preservation, because that's what really, it combines all these different things. You can be a scientist and an advocate for your culture. So it's really nice. That's all I have to add. Thanks. Um, so yeah, so uh, I, I just looked at the time and I might have zipped through a few information. So this, this uh, is open to questions. So anybody has questions or comments, please ask me or us. We are actually both here. Um, otherwise, yeah, uh, the, we will, uh, uh, CSAN has the slide, so they will share them with you as well. Um, but yeah, please ask us questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Monize and um, your 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 colleague, right? Um, yes, they joined how, the call. Just okay, Tao Dam. Sorry, I'm, I'm yes, not sure. Yes, Tao Dam. Also okay. Ah, uh, okay, Tao Dam. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, please, um, our participant, if you have any question, um, we can also type them in the chat if you don't feel like speaking. Yeah. If you think you are not able to um, talk because of internet connection or whatever, please uh, type your question in the chat box so that we all can see it. And I will also share the link for the Google form, which is in the chat box for people to um, get on their email. So if they can yeah. figure out their interest. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I think maybe they need some time. Okay, let me go ahead then. I have um, one question. It's really interesting to see that the project also um, involves youth in the agriculture. Mm. Yes. And so do you guys work with youth? or also work directly with their family, meaning that their parents, their relatives as well, or not just with the target area? So actually, uh, the Agritech Center works mostly with young people in the sense that we work with schools who will send young people. So it is the best avenue for us as a charity to to attract um, young people. But what's exciting about this project is that we like we have the chance to now go and speak with family and also grown up because it's the adults who will be having more knowledge about perhaps these kind of ingredients more than young people, but we will continue to involve young people. So I think with what we will find is with this research, we have a, we, we expand on our target population, but, um, but definitely at the Agritech Center, because of partnerships with schools, they are the immediate kind of target uh, individuals. It's in the beginning, um, and this is more because it's sort of green shoots related sort of de project development. If we wanted to attract a lot of farmers to come as well, but it is hard because they have their time and they, they have uh, their food to grow and, and home duties. So they, they are the, the harder participants to just attract. So young people is easier working with schools. But what I will find, I think with this project, Plant Planet Plate, we, we will definitely be more in households. We will have an opportunity to speak with 
uh, family members as well. Great. Um, I think I have one question, but now I have another one. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> it's really interesting. Um, so so far, um, um, what are the main challenges in terms of implement this project? Not on not on, not only with the youth, but any challenges that you want to share and the lesson learned because your work is also similar to us as well, she said. So yeah. maybe we can learn from you because in our technology park also plant the wild food. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we also engage uh, youth from the high school as well. Yeah. So yeah, learning from you guys is good. Yeah, please. Thank you. <laughs> So I, I'm learning from you because I speak with Srun, Dr. Srun all, all, uh -huh. all the time. So I am learning from you guys as much. Um, so with the Agritech Center, I think some, one of the challenges is, as I mentioned, to can keep attracting people to the space. You know, it's there, it's a demonstration. And, but to make sure everyone is coming regularly, we have to do a lot of village outreach. It is not a one-time thing. It is something to do all the time and and it is but it takes it takes uh, a lot of uh, resources and one of the things that we learned to do is um, take what we are growing to the village because the village was not coming to us so we would actually go and have meetings and take tea that we have made or some drinks that we had made and share to to sort of get them excited and try to come and visit us um, work and so one of them one of the challenges with the agritech center was that how do we keep sort of pe exciting people and and so now and one of the other ways to overcome that challenge is to do exciting projects like this people know what a farm is they it's nothing that different from their day, daily life but if you do exciting projects like this, which make them which make them think, which make them see things differently, is is another way we are actually trying to overcome the challenge. And the challenge specifically with this project, I can probably tell you in August because that's when we will have finished most of our research. But okay. for now, I think it's mostly exciting. And um, actually, they have done their research in Cambodia for PhD previously on wild food so um any challenges perhaps you want to share mm -hmm. okay thank well, you <laughs> despite having to do research during the covid pandemic when it first started ah. um yeah i arrived on february 19th 2020 it was very unlucky um i think before the pandemic happened uh, finding people to talk about plants uh, was actually very easy. So many different people. And if they didn't know exactly the names of the plants, they could describe to me like what they do, where they got them from, things like that. And um, a few of my friends also told me that they would just know about these things because their their parents would just mention it and they would remember. But I think... Overall, when it comes to just speaking to people about plants and food, everyone is very friendly. I mean, who doesn't love to talk about food? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's that's the only thing I could see being a problem. Like as Wednesday said, continued engagement because when you're doing anything within the community long enough, maybe the community gets tired of being asked all these questions. Uh, <laughs> I know yeah. that it happens everywhere. So yeah. I think they call it saturation or just survey saturation. But I think that personally, I would like to do a lot of the the cooking parts where we cook together and we talk because that way it feels less like research and just more like having fun. Mm -hmm. And you can learn a lot when you have fun. <laughs> so that's that's what I'm hoping that we can kind of do, make it more fun. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dam. Yeah. So um yeah, before move on, I don't know whether how many we have of one us... we have one more question online. Uh oh. so I will read it out. Okay. It's from Chun Sripe. How do you do with the food events and recipe collection? Could you tell briefly about your activities to collect the data or organize a food event? So um 
I will uh, answer that a little bit. Um, with the food events, we will basically be doing them at the Agritech Center in Lemonche. So we have a we we will join sort of ask the community to join us, um, and they will be participating in the research as Ashley mentioned, and it will be quite sort of collaborative in the sense that we will have ingredients and we, we can cook together and understand. So it is it is part of the research. And um, some of the data collection is of course through interviews. So we will be going out in the field and we will have the list of questions to ask them. Uh, and I suggest you join the next few lectures that we plan to do which we share more detail about the research methods. This was just an introduction to the, the whole research and how we design the questions, who we ask, what are our criteria is, is in the next one. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Monize, for your response. So um, before move on, may I ask all of us to turn on the camera just to have a group photo for a good memory of these lectures and yeah. <laughs> so could you please turn on the camera and I will do mine so as well. Can you see me? I cannot see myself. <laughs> I can see you. Okay, okay, yeah. So um, I will uh, start counting one, two, three, and then um, someone will help us to do the screenshot of the group photo, okay? Mm, okay. So are you guys ready? <laughs> yes. Okay, so one, two, three. Are you done, Buntuk? Oh, okay, it's done. Okay, okay. thank you so thank much. Thank you. So Buntuk is our communication officer. So um, he's just have to organize the, like the OBS line, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Mm. So I will off my cameras to, you know, sometimes the internet here is not stable. Okay. okay. Yeah, okay. So for those who join this and don't know me, I am Tida, the program manager. So yeah, um, so please, do you have any question? Or if not, we can move on, right? Yes, thank you so much. And uh, I hope to be in touch with all of you in the coming days and hope you fill out the form. We can also make it available on through CSEN network so other people can be interested. If you know any friends who would who have missed the lecture and you think they would really like it, then please do share uh, with others about it. And we hope to have some more dates to get deeper into the research. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Monize and uh, uh, Dam as well, and also to uh, everyone who uh, joined this lecture today. And have a good day. See you next okay. time. See yeah. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.